We're going to start with Better Homes and Gardens. Better Homes and Gardens refers to a magazine that is still available these days. And I don't know if any of you get magazines, probably digital online things or things you can get on your phone, right? But but uh, for this magazine, they, they always have this beautiful logo. And it's kind of fitting for us because we're talking about Earth, right? And we've just left what was pretty much almost an un uninhabitable Earth in Archean time. It was only good for things that liked carbon dioxide and that could photosynthesize. So we had plenty of sunlight, we had plenty of ocean water, and we had plenty of stromatolites. And so stromatolites began to give us this, this sort of atmosphere. It's not anything like it is today, but it would have been something that would have approached uh, something that would have been livable for some organisms. And so we're going to get into the very first organisms, the organism level of creatures that uh, inhabited this planet, something beyond the cyanobacteria, in other words. So we're going to start by talking about banded iron formation. It sounds like a simple term, but banded iron formation uh, conveys a lot of information. So we're going to talk about BIFs. Okay. So BIFs, we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about the GOE as well, because they're like this. Okay. So banded iron formation and the great oxygenation or the great oxidation event goes by both names. Uh, they go hand in hand. And so then we're also going to talk about a couple of supercontinents. So these supercontinents, in fact, are known as Columbia or Nunya, they has two different names, and then also we're going to talk about the supercontinent Rodinia. And all three of those, well, the two of them really, because Columbia and Nunya are essentially the same, and Rodinia, they both occurred during the Proterozoic. So from the Archean, we're going into the Proterozoic now, and eventually, with the next lecture, we're going to talk about the end of the Proterozoic. And so this lecture and the next lecture are going to cover all that you need to have for the exam that's coming up on Friday. Now, I realize it's Wednesday, so I'm going to get these things uploaded just as quickly as I can. So we're going to talk about the supercontinents. We're going to top, talk about a, um, a type of algae, probably, but people don't know exactly what it is. But it's one of these enigmatic sort of things that was around a little over a billion years ago. But it's much more sophisticated than what the stromatolites were. It's called Grypania. So Grypania, we're going to take a look at. I'm going to show you where some has been collected before. And then also we're going to go on to a an idea that's called Snowball Earth. And Snowball Earth and the banded iron formation and the great oxygenation event are all walking hand in hand through this lecture. So we're going to talk about climate, or at least paleoclimate, a lot in this lecture. So let's start. First, let's talk about life's timeline. So if Earth formed four and a half billion years ago, and then about 2,500 uh, million years ago, we had the beginning of the Proterozoic. You can see that on here with that red dot that's up towards the the uh, upper part of the right-hand column here, and then above that. So that is the formation of one of those supercontinents. And so I want to put it into context that way. So 2500 is roughly the base of the Proterozoic as well. So the Proterozoic, we had the formation of a new supercontinent, and that would be Columbia and Nunya. And then later on, we would have Rodinia that formed, and Rodinia would break up around 750 million years ago. So a couple of supercontinents that formed from these early tectonic sort of events. On here, you can also see the earliest water that was here, which was in the Hadean time. Remember, we had some rocks that are Hadean in age, not too many, but a few. And then finally, we have the earliest known life. And, and really, what they're really talking about there are the earliest stromatolites. And really, when we talk about that, we think that the earliest stromatolites predated the ones probably that are preserved in Western Australia. So those ones are 3.4 or 3, as I recall, um, billion years old. And so we had uh, the late heavy bombardment of meteorites. We had the earliest oxygen show up then shortly after the first stromatolites. How do we know that? Well, you're going to find out in a second here. We had glaciations after that. So there was a, a Pangola, a gla Pangola gla glaciation. There was another one called the Huronian glaciation, if you follow up on that right-hand column there. So there was atmospheric oxygen that shows up roughly after the 2500 year, so 2600, about 2670, 26, 2700 is about the first record of lots of atmospheric oxygen perhaps showing up. 
And then we finally get eukaryotes that actually are around after that at some point. And so that would include things well, like the things that we were just talking about, Grypania and so forth. And then there's early multicellular life. There's early fungi. Uh, there are the earliest plants, the earliest animals. All that's going to show up and that's going to be in the next lecture. So, But for now, we're going to talk about the banded iron formation. The banded iron formation is one of these astonishingly beautiful sorts of rock deposits. This is a photograph from the north um, well, they call it the North Shore of Lake Superior. It's a little bit inland from the North Shore of Lake Superior. It's an area where they mined iron ore back at the turn of the last century. And so this is actually banded iron formation right here. It's rusty in color, right? Well, iron rusts, right? Um, the type of iron that they mine there, there's really two species of minerals that are responsible. Uh, that is, um, well, two primary uh, minerals that they mine, and that would be magnetite and hematite. And so magnetite and hematite really aren't red in color, but the rocks that are interbedded with them are because they are oxidized somewhat. So when iron oxidizes, it turns red. When iron is in a reduced state, it will turn the rocks that it is in into a green color. And so there's a difference right there in the oxygenation state of iron of iron and it has to do with the valence of iron actually and so I know that chemistry is not a part of this class but in fact there are two states that we're concerned about with iron and actually maybe three states one's a two plus one's a three plus and then the other one's a four plus and actually magnetite is associated with the four plus state of oxygenation or, or valence within the iron um, uh, iron, uh, elemental iron that is in the uh, atmosphere, not so much in the atmosphere, in the oceans, in the early oceans had iron in them. And so that was mostly in the Fe2 plus state. So photosynthesis was occurring by stromatolites at this time. One of the byproducts of photosynthesis is oxygen, right? So you take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, you put oxygen back into the atmosphere, except in this case, you're putting it back into the oceans first, right? So it goes into the oceans. And what's it doing in the oceans? Well, there's actually dissolved iron in the oceans from that Fe2. And what happens is the Fe2 comes in contact with that oxygen that the the uh, stromatolites have expelled, and next thing you know, you've got rust. And so that's what your banded iron formation essentially is. It's a combination of the iron minerals and then also the oxidized versions of other minerals that would be in the water as well. In this case, it's going to be mostly silica. So silica would turn red in the interlayers in banded iron formation, and that gives it its, its bands as well. So banded iron formation is very common around the world on almost every continent. And in fact, in this case, uh, we're looking at rocks that are really pretty old. So around two and a half billion years old uh, in this case anyway. Um, so you may not know this, but you can actually get poisoned by oxygen. There's something called oxygen toxicity. If you have like 100%, if you try to breathe 100% oxygen, it'll kill you. Okay, so oxygen is actually toxic to many animals. It's toxic to many plants, in fact, unless they have something to kind of buffer the effects of that, of that oxygen. And in plants, we have ADP and ATP, which are phosphates. And so the phosphates are really important for animals to be able to incorporate that into our structure in order to, to metabolize that oxygen properly and to be able to use the oxygen in small amounts. And so here we're looking at deposits that would record the first release of oxygen with the photosynthesis of stromatolites. But stromatolites at some point were able to then, they have to be able to use the sugars that they have, so they oxidize those sugars in order to grow and become, you know, or to, to metabolize and to reproduce and everything, right? So to carry on the bodily functions or the the cellular functions that they would need in order to propagate, essentially. So here we have banded iron formation up close and personal. Now it's a sedimentary rock, right? So it's sedimentary to begin with. And it's got magnetite and hematite in it. We have already talked about that. The beds in between, in fact, are made out of silicon. So that's chert. And in this case, in this banded iron formation here, it has layers of stromatolites. And so the stromatolites are actually growing up. 
And the iron itself is actually a sedimentary particle that gets in between those stromatolites. So the stromatolites are growing up at an angle here, you can see. Notice that the chert can either be red, it can be green, it can be gray, or it can be white, but usually it's either red or green in these banded iron formations, and most commonly it's red, and because red is the oxygenation state, okay, for turning something into Fe3+. So, uh, so the stromatolites are here, uh, and these banded iron formations, they're really common in the Archean. They go into the Proterozoic, and they pretty much die out towards the end of the Proterozoic, in fact, at the end of a time period known as the Cryogenium. We're going to talk about the Cryogenium when we talk a little bit more about climate change. So Fe2 was soluble in the oceans, but when you get to Fe3, all of a sudden it precipitates out. And that's the dark layers that you see in this rock. So the dark areas are the iron minerals that are in this rock. And because of that, uh, because of this type of rock, and because it's found all around the world, even though the first ones were found in the United States, in Michigan, in fact, they, they constitute 60% of the world's iron reserves. So if you took all of the iron that's available for mining all around the world, 60% of it's in banded iron formation. Here's another example that's uncut and unpolished, and here you can see the hematite interlayered with red chert. Now, chert is a type of sedimentary rock that is called, um, it's, it's cryptocrystalline quartz is how we refer to it, and so chert is actually silica, SiO2, but it has the red staining in it because it has that iron minerals that have been oxidized, and so that gives it the red color. It's rusty, right? So there are two, two varieties of banded iron formation. They call them the algomon, and then also the superior uh, varieties of, of red chert. Uh, algoma uh, variety, in fact, is very common near volcanoes, and so it's much more common in the older varieties. The superior variety is more like what's in the Masabi range, and people think that that's related to ocean upwelling of unoxygenated waters, bearing that iron in solution, bringing it up onto a shelfful sort of setting, and there it becomes oxidized, and you get the red layers then in that case. So the red is the oxidized iron. Green layers, in fact, would indicate reduced iron or the Fe2 plus uh, iron. Here's some more just to show you that I'm not uh, kidding you about what's going on around the rest of the world. Here you can see layers of chert and iron, and some of the chert is red, some of it is kind of yellowish white here. Uh, but this is from the Pilbara, and of course you know that from this uh, when we talked about stromatolites and the early stromatolites, so Pilbara craton in this uh, situation here. So that is one of the banded iron formations. Where do they occur? Well, they occur in Australia, obviously. They occur in Brazil. They occur in Canada, northern Canada, northwestern Canada, India, Russia, South Africa, Ukraine, and then also the United States. And, of course, they were first found in Michigan in 1844, in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, in fact. So, um, yeah, there's places called Iron Mountain and a few other places. My dad actually mapped many of those places back in the 1950s, I think it was, uh, for the U.S. Geological Survey. And so <clears throat> when we talk about the time. So in this diagram that you see here, these are the occurrences of banded iron formation through geologic time. You can see the locations on that list on the right, but on the left hand, well, on the bottom here in that peak, you can actually see that there's a great abundance right near the 2.5 billion year mark or 2,500 million year mark is an easier way to say it sometimes. And then there's another peak down here around around 750 million years, okay? So uh, one of those is related to a late-stage glaciation during the Proterozoic, and that's the snowball earth um, time, if you will. And so many of the oceans, in fact, they think froze over at that time. But in fact, there was still life that was capable of making making a living, essentially, through the middle band of, uh, of earth at that time, and, of course, ocean life only at that time as well. So the great oxygenation event, or GOE, is indicated here by the great abundance of BIFs right around that 2.5 billion year age. And that's really one of the reasons that we even recognize the Proterozoic. It's like you get banded iron formations, most likely it's going to be Proterozoic in age. So the ones before that are less common 
The ones after that are more common. And in fact, you also know that that's a time when stromatolites hit their peak as well. So the oxygen comes from the stromatolites primarily, at least that's what we think. And then because of that, the iron that is in the oceans, it gets completely absorbed into those mineralizations that make up the bands then, right? The oxidized state for the iron. So iron in, iron in its oxidized state, iron and then iron in its oxidized state. And so band after band after band of that sort of activity. It indicates some sort of cyclicity, in other words. So the cyclicity, what does that mean? What, how can it be cyclic like that? And why do you get these bands like that? Well, it's probably more than tidal bands. And so people have suggested they could be annual bands or more likely they could be decadal bands when the chemistry of the oceans may have changed. So you have the iron there and then it may oxidize and then it may you have another iron event and then it oxidizes again. So nobody's quite sure about what the band, what that band width is. So uh, time frequency analysis, I know that people have done that on this but most of them have been inconclusive and suggest that it's more of a decadal sort of issue uh, for, for these sort of banded iron formations to have formed. Now, why are they down here at the very end of the Proterozoic as well? Well, that's when the Earth went into a glacial phase. So if we have stromatolites pumping oxygen into the atmosphere, and that atmospheric oxygen begins to rise after that peak here in the banded iron formation, by the time you get into, you know, 1.5 billion years here, that's the end of the main peak here on this diagram, there's oxygen in the atmosphere for the first time, and all of a sudden you've got something that multicellular animals can actually use and metabolize for their sort of like purposes as well. And because of that, if we pump out the carbon dioxide, we lose part of our solar shield, which is this greenhouse effect that we have. If we lose the greenhouse effect, Earth becomes a very cold and kind of almost sterile place. And we developed what we call snowball Earth at that time by pumping out an excess of carbon dioxide. Well, it doesn't mean we wouldn't have oxygen back then. We still had oxygen. So there was this sort of like... Um, uh, a spike then again in the in the banded iron formation under those sort of like conditions when it was very cold and uh, very inhospitable for most life forms. So the great oxygenation event was roughly somewhere between 2.4 and 2.0 billion years ago. Remember the, the stromatolites photosynthesize, they reduce the carbon uh, dioxide, they increase the oxygen in the shallow oceans to begin with at first. If we have the Fe2 plus being spilled onto those shallow shells from a deeper setting in an area where it's not oxygenated, all of a sudden we may have uh, uh, too much oxygen and it may become toxic. And of course, uh, the, the stromatolites are pretty good at handling at that time, but in fact, the iron is really what saved our, our skins back then, I guess you could say, by precipitating out. And uh, so it probably led to an extinction of some of the earliest animals that may have been sulfur-fixing bacteria and things like that. And so there's this idea of an early extinction with the great oxygenation event as well. Not things that would have been multicellular animals like you and I, but in fact, some of the earliest bacteria are archaea, which would have been sulfur-fixing sort of bacterias. They kind of took a, took a hit right then. Let's go to the supercontinents. What are the supercontinents back in? Well, here's a configuration for Colombia and Nunia here. And when you look at it, you can actually see many of the modern continents are composed of at least pieces of that. North America is actually known as Laurentia all the way into uh, Pennsylvanian age, and so that would have been about 300 million years ago. But here we have Baltica, Siberia, Amazonia, West Africa, India. All of these continents were once together, but fit together in different puzzle pieces at the time. So that is Columbia or Nunia. When we look at Rodinia, that's the second continent that's going to form. So that first continent would have broken apart again, rifted apart, and then brought been brought back together again by by subduction around the perimeter and subduction would round up all the continents again and push them together in this sort of configuration. So Antarctica, in fact, probably was off the west coast of Laurentia. Most people uh, agree that at least Australia was off there in Siberia. 
very important to see these sort of configurations because these are the sort of things that scientists argue about all the time. So at roughly 1.1 billion years ago, that's when everything kind of got roped in together and everything kind of got clustered in. And that's where we see mountain belts. Mountain belts that aren't there anymore, in fact, but mountain belts that are still recorded in some of the rocks, let's say in upstate New York. And so the Adirondack Mountains are a result of these collisions that occurred in the eastern part of Laurentia. In western Laurentia, we don't see that. Western Laurentia, in fact, was a rift back around 760 million years ago. So everything kind of broke apart again. So if things come together and they break apart again, we call that the Wilson cycle. It's named after J. Tuzlo Wilson, the guy who gave us the term plate tectonics. So here we have Rodinia. If we zoom in on a part of the continent, not only did things break apart again, so Laurentia became a free agent again after breaking up about 760 million years ago, there was also rifts that developed in the mid-continent region. And so if you start in northern Kansas, northeastern Kansas, you can trace what they call the mid-continent rift all the way through North America, it goes up through the Great Lakes, goes through Michigan, all the way down into Ohio, and that was called the uh, the Mid-Continent Rift System. And there's actually some other rifts that d d developed back then, too. There's one in southeastern Missouri called the Real Foot Rift. And then there's one in southern Oklahoma. It's called the Southern Oklahoma Alocogen. Now, an Alocogen is a failed rift. And the Mid-Continent Rift was a failed rift. And so was the Real Foot Rift. All of those were failed rifts, in fact. So once we broke apart, there was no longer the impetus for the heat to build up underneath the continent. So the rift stopped. But it did leave behind a calling card. There were actually volcanics associated with the Mid-Continent Rift, and many of those, in fact, were in place, or the, the eruptions occurred, along the north shore of what would eventually become Lake Superior. So Lake Superior today exposes many of these rocks. Now, Lake Superior is a result of the, the last major glaciation that has occurred over the last 2.5 million years. These rocks date back one and a half billion years, practically at 1.2, 1.4 billion years in age. And so here you can see some of those rocks as they are mapped. So geologic maps, in fact, have all sorts of, of varieties of colors on there for the same types of rocks that you would see. You remember we talked about the Gunflint chert and the animals that you could see in there? Well, the Gunflint area is actually shown on here, just above that Duluth complex here. You see where the bright blue is there? Well, just above that is a Gunflint area. The Masabi Range is often to the west over here on the west side of this image, but in this area where the Duluth complex is exposed, there's a type of fossil called Gripenia. Let me show you some pictures. It's always nice to see what these areas look like. This is the basalts that are exposed in the Duluth complex. There's a, you know, they put uh, lighthouses everywhere around in these giant bluffs. They didn't want the tanker, the uh, the huge uh, uh, freighters, the ones that were loaded with iron ore and everything that was being mined out of the Mesabi Ranch. They would take it down to to Cleveland and to Detroit and, and different uh places where they had steel uh, being made. And so the foundries and all those sorts of industrial complexes that were very active would use steel or use the the iron ore out of the Masabi range. And so they put the, the lighthouses here to keep the ships from wrecking, okay? So like the, the ore freighters and everything that were going through the Great Lakes. And so there's, a, there's one, of the, uh, one of the lighthouses there. You can see this country along the north shore of Lake Superior is absolutely stunningly beautiful. Um, we're looking at the Minnesota side, the opposite sides over in Wisconsin and northern Michigan there, the upper peninsula of Michigan. But yeah, so many of these are really, really old rocks. And so these things date back 1.5 billion years, some of them, and all the way to uh, 1.0 roughly uh, billion years. Here's a rhyolite, so it wasn't just... Um, it wasn't just the mafic sort of like eruptions that you would get here. Here's a rhyolite that is composing this palisade head uh, right here. Um, here's Nancy actually uh, for scale in this image that shows you some sedimentary rocks at the bottom. Those are shales and sandstones at the bottom, but it's overlain in this case by basaltic flows. So the basalt came in and buried that sort of sedimentary rock. But interestingly enough, where that sedimentary rock is exposed, 
you will find fossils like these. So this is this is one of the fossils that I have. In fact, you see the loops on the surface, on the top surface of that rock? That's called Gripania. So Gripania is thought to be an algae, but it's a 1.1 billion year old algae. And so it actually forms tube-like structures. It's got a protuberance at one end of it, but they always kind of loop around like that. And so just an unusual sort of, of creature. But what it shows us, in fact, is that it was more than just archaea and bacteria that were living in the early Earth at 1.5, 1.1 billion years in this case, uh, where we see that. Okay, if we fast forward just a little bit in time to roughly, well, well this is actually roughly that same time, Snowball Earth was going on at that time, and in fact, much of the Earth's oceans would have frozen solid. Uh, not completely solid, but there would have been liquid water below it, maybe a little bit like Europa is today, one of the moons of Jupiter. And so in this case, what do we look for when we look for ancient glacial deposits? Well, we look for rocks like these down here on the lower right here, and you can see that those have big chunks floating in a very fine-grained sort of rock. It's a siltstone, in fact. And so that's called a glacial diamictite. That's one of the that's one of the lines of evidence, in fact, for looking for glacial deposits that you will see a diamictite. Really large class floating in something that's very fine grain. That's because the glaciers carry these blocks in and then they drop them sometimes. And so some of these are called drop stones. And so drop stones, very, very common, in fact, in many different settings. These rocks, in fact, here are not from that area. These are from the Flinders Range in Australia. And the Flinders Range is going to play a major component when we're going to talk about the earliest life forms on this planet that are, that are more common, a little bit more common than Gripania. So here we have... Uh, a diamictite. We have the glacial uh, reconstruction essentially for what Snowball Earth may have looked like back during the uh, the late Proterozoic here. And so this is a time period known as the Cryogenian, meaning the Ice Age essentially. It was the end of the Proterozoic here, or close to the end of the Proterozoic. The very end of the Proterozoic, in fact, saw the first blooming of life on this planet. All but one continent has Ediacaran fauna. So Ediacara is the name of a, a, a group of hills that are in the Flinders Range in south central Australia. And so the cryogenian ended, and after the ice melts, all of a sudden things got warm again. There was enough carbon dioxide to make a sort of blanket around the Earth again, at least a somewhat of a blanket, to make it warmer. And once we had that warm little pond... Well, you know what's going to happen next. We're going to have life forms that show up. Where it originally came from, we don't know, but we have certain organisms that have already appeared, right? So we already have the the uh, prokaryotes. Now we've got Gripania, and all of a sudden we're going to have this cluster of other animals. And I'm going to show you pictures of a lot of these things. So that's in the next presentation, in fact. So we end the, the cryogenian, and then we move on to now the Ediacaran. Anyway, thanks for your attention. By the way, um, we've done three quizzes already, right? So, and I know that some of you apparently missed the email for quiz number three. Uh, I sent out emails and there's also a, an announcement that goes along. You got to pay attention. Okay. <laughs> and so, um, you know, how do you deal with it when people just like blanket, like missed, you know, miss a quiz? So what I've decided to do is I'm going to drop the lowest quiz score. So please don't contact me if you've missed a quiz. You know that you were alerted to those at some point, And I'd mentioned having a quiz on that Monday uh, sometime the previous week. I think it was on the Wednesday of the previous week. But anyway, just know that those things are going to be announced. I'll always announce them, just like we're going to have the exam on Friday. This material will be on the exam. The next presentation will be on the, on the exam as well, but then you can take the exam beginning at noon on Friday. I'm doing the best I can to keep up with this. This is like driving me nuts, okay? <laughs> but it's all right. That's my job, okay? So I, I get a lot of this, okay? So, but here we go. That's the end of this lecture. We're going to start on the next one almost immediately. Anyway, thanks for your attention. And thanks for hanging in with me. This is the first time to teach this course, and I'm, I'm hoping I've given you enough information to make it um, interesting and appealing to you, and you'll feel like you've learned something once you get to the end of this course. So anyway, thanks for your time.
talk to you in just a few minutes here. Yeah, bye now.